For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Good evening, everyone. Hope you all are doing absolutely well. For our God is great and he is greatly to be praised. And I am grateful that God trusts me with this opportunity to be able to spend this time with each one of you in the virtual space. Thank the Lord for Wednesday evening and a chance to be able to rightly divide the word, the truth together. I'm grateful that God is faithful and God is just and God is kind to us, his people. If you will, join me now for an opening word of prayer before we begin. Oh, Lord, our Lord, Father, how excellent is thy name upon the earth. Thank you, oh God, that you are sovereign and you are supreme. And tonight I pray that you would be glorified in the midst of our convening. Thank you for your holy written word, oh God. Thank you that it is what we live by. As the psalmist said, thy word have we hidden in our hearts that we might not sin against thee, Lord God. Tonight, I pray that you bless our time together. Give us impartation. Give us revelation, O oh God. We may be able to apply your word and work your word out, O oh God, because your word works when we work the word. And so thank you tonight. Forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord God, I pray that you would use the teacher tonight to be able to teach to these your beloved people, O oh God, from your word and not from my emotions. I thank you tonight. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, let them, Lord God, be acceptable in thy sight, for you are my strength and you are my redeemer. In Christ Jesus' name we do pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Again, good evening, everyone. Hope you all are doing absolutely well. We thank the Lord for who he is and all of his glory and all of his splendor. Thank you all for being on with us tonight in the virtual platform. Thank the Lord that he has allowed for us to be able to have these various virtual platforms to be able to spread the message of Jesus Christ both near and far. Tonight, we want to jump back into the teaching we've been doing on let's talk about the church, right? Let's talk about the church. At Bible-based church, um, this year, our theme for our year is the year of a healthy church. That's what we are praying about. That's what we're working toward. That's what we believe in God for is to be a healthy church. And that means healthy in all facets, right? Our spiritual health, our physical health, our emotional health, our mental health, our financial health, right? We want to be healthy in all regards so that we're able to obey the Lord when God speaks, right? We don't have to be stressful about do we have the money in the bank? Is our bodies well enough? Are we mentally and spiritually, emotionally fit to be able to do this. We want to be a healthy church, not a healthy pastor, but a healthy church, right? Not a healthy praise ministry, music ministry, but a healthy church. And so a part of that is really understanding um, the the original intention of our God as relates to his church. And so we've been in Acts chapter number two for the last few weeks dealing with, let's talk about the church. And I want to take you back there, if I may, Acts chapter two. I'm going to go back there. Now, my desire tonight, hear me now, my desire tonight is to get us through on what we've begun. We've been dealing with the 12 characteristics of the early church in Acts chapter 2. My desire is to get us through this tonight. Um, we finished, I think, with number 6. Uh, may have been number 7. I'm going to do a recap. My goal is to get us through all 12 because the next part of our teaching uh, that the Spirit of the Lord has pressed upon me is to talk about spiritual gifts or talk about spiritual gifts. Um, and so that is a part of um, the next portion of let's talk about the church, dealing with spiritual gifts, right? Every believer of the Lord Jesus Christ has at least one spiritual gift. I'll say it again. Every believer of the Lord Jesus Christ has at least one spiritual gift. Now, why is that important? Because if we all have at least one spiritual gift, then the question begs to be asked, is that spiritual gift that has been bestowed upon us, entrusted to us, is it being put in circulation and used for um, the building up of the Lord's kingdom? Or are we sitting on those gifts, right? So there are persons who will say, uh, I don't have a spiritual gift. That's not true. You have at least one spiritual gift. And so my task will be to be able to do scripture, show you what the Bible says about the various spiritual gifts, and then try to help you identify where your gifts are, right? Important. I'll use me for an example. My spiritual gifts that I know of, right? I have the gift of preaching. I have the gift of teaching. I have the gift of administration, right? 
right? I have those gifts. Those gifts are strong upon my life, right? You can have very strong gifts that, that are very apparent, and you can have other gifts where, you know, there is a reflection of those things in that regard, right? And so we want to spend time walking through each of these um, as, as we conclude this part of our assignment. But tonight, we're going to deal with the 12 characteristics of the early church and Acts chapter 2. And so if you would go to Acts chapter 2, I would greatly appreciate it. Acts chapter 2, it is the fifth book of the New Testament, right? We have the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Thereafter is Acts of the Apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Acts of the Apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we want to go there if we can. I've shared before, I'll recap and say it again because we did not convene last Wednesday, that the book of Acts is the sequel book, right? It's a part of a two-part work. The first part is the gospel according to Luke, right? Luke the physician is the author of the gospel according to Luke, but also the author of Acts of the Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Luke is not um, a one of the original 12 disciples. He's not, right? He is a traveling companion of, um, of the Apostle Peter, Right. He's a traveling companion. And so he's writing um, based on things that have been shared with him and then also things that he bore witness to as well. He's writing to Theophilus. Right. Theophilus. And there are questions by theologians throughout the historical years as to who Theophilus was. Is he a new convert in the faith? Um, some theologians have argued that maybe he was the one who was financially um, funding Luke's ministry. Right. Um, some have argued that he is a. Um, high dignitary um, in in the royal regate. We don't know the truth of that, right? It's very arguments. What we do know is that he writes both gospel according to Luke and the Acts of the Apostle of Jesus Christ to Theophilus. So Theophilus is a recipient of both of these. So Acts of the Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ is, is, a, is part two of a two-part work. That's important for us to understand. Acts of the Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ is a historical book. Right. That's important to know in the Old Testament. Right. There are varying books. There are various books that equate to being um, the historical books. And I think that's important. So when you look at the Old Testament, right, um, the, from the book of Joshua all the way to the book of Esther, those are known as historical books. Right. So the, the, from the book of Joshua to the book of Esther, those are known as historical books. Right. Remember, now I told you this before, the Old Testament is broken down as the, the first five books of the Bible, right, which is, which is the Torah, the books of Moses, you have the historical books, then you have the, the, the writings of the poem, and then you have the prophetic books. In the New Testament, you have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, actually, the Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ is the only historical book, right? And then from Romans all the way to the book of Jude, those are known as epistles or letters. And then Revelation is our only apocalyptic book, right? We talk about the apocalypse. Now, why is that important? Because um, it is critically important for us to know, for us to know, help me, Lord, is that the Acts of the Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ is the long historical book in the New Testament, um, in the New Testament. Miss Cynthia, I'm using the New Living Translation tonight, the New Living Translation tonight. Thanks for that question. Um, and so actually the Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ is um, historical book, right? And there have been some who have tried to argue that Acts of the Apostle is the fifth gospel. That's not true. It's a historical book, right? Now, now there are, um, because it is a part, a two part, a part of a two part work, right? There are some carryovers into Acts of the Apostle that I think are very important, right? There are some carryovers there that I think is important. When you read um, the beginning of chapter one, right, you see mention of jesus christ and his and his post-resurrection life and that which is done in his post-resurrection life before he's ascended there's things that he does in the earth right um for 40 days giving infallible proofs right so that thing that that's important um, for us to understand um, i want to delve right in for the time that we have together i want to deal with the 12 characteristics of the early church in acts chapter number two i want to give a recap on the ones that we've already covered and then I want to delve into the remaining. My hope and desire tonight is to conclude these 12 so that we can shift to our spiritual gifts assignment. If we don't finish it tonight, I'm not upset. 
right? There's more Wednesdays ahead of us if it be the Lord's will. So I'm not upset about that. But let's go right in, right? So there are 12 characteristics of the early church in Acts chapter 2. The first one is that they, the church was devoted to Scripture. Acts chapter 2, verse number 42 said, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, right? So the first characteristic is the church was devoted to Scripture. As a local church, Bible-based church or any other local church, we ought to be known for being devoted to Scripture, right? It is, I am not insulted when people say he's a Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching pastor, right? I'm not. Um, I used to, early in my ministry, um, I would always be known as he's a good teaching preacher. I used to get very insulted, right, by that because I felt like people weren't respecting um, my preaching style, right, because I'm I'm way more expository and narrative in my preaching than I am topical and textual. Um, people, I felt like people weren't respecting my way of preaching, right? He's a good teaching preacher, uh, meaning that people were saying I didn't, I'm, I wasn't a good hooper and the things of that nature. Uh, when I was early in ministry, I used to get very, very offended by that and, and called it deemed an insult. As I matured, as the Spirit of the Lord has matured me, I count it as a great honor to be known as a Bible preaching, Bible teaching preacher, to be known as a good teaching preacher. I'm honored by that. Because what that means then is that people are recognizing that I am putting in the work to make sure that we rightly divide the word of truth. I know it's not about me, so this is not about vainglory. My point of that is, is that it is not an insult to be known as someone who is devoted to scripture. All right. Um, I want us to always be careful as to how we handle the word of God. There's enough fallacy. There's enough false teachings. There's, a, there's enough incorrect dogma out there. I don't want to be aligned with that level of thinking or teaching. You hear what I'm telling you. Um, there are people who are preaching and teaching things that are not aligned with the word of God. And whenever we take the text out of context, right, it becomes dangerous, right? There are people who've taken one verse of scripture out of context and they've run with that. And now you have people in dangerous situation. In the early black Baptist church, a woman got um, pregnant out of wedlock. They brought her in front of the church to scold her. And she had to apologize to the church. And the church then made the decision whether they would restore her. They never dealt with the man. Well, where does that come from, Pastor D? That comes from them catching a woman in the act of adultery and bringing her, Je they bringing her to Jesus and asking, what should we do? they taken that out of context and they created that into the church. And there are people who have been wounded by that act in church. And they've left the local church and they hate God because of that treatment. Well, when you have biblical when you have biblical illiteracy amongst the people, you do things that have no uh, no earthly idea. Um, they say, "Why submit to your husband?" Right? The Bible does say that, but that's an incomplete statement, right? There's more that the Lord said. Husbands love your wives, even as Christ had loved the church and gave Himself for it. Right? It says, it says wives to submit to their, their their own husband. It does say that, but so much is said before and after that it has to be read in. In totality, but what's happening is we're taking that one verse and now we use that verse to dominate and and be dictators over our wives and women of God. Because, again, biblical illiteracy has created problems in the church. When you're devoted to scripture, then you know that a trained student of the word of God does not just read one verse and finish it. You read the pretext of the text, read the post text of the text, then you cross reference the text. Right. You don't just read um, Acts 2.42 and that's it. No, you read before that. You read that and you read after that. Right. Because that's important to understand what was going on before that verse. What was being said? What's the tone and the tenor? What's the geography of the location? Who's the one speaking? Who's the audience being spoken to? What's the time setting of what's going on? All of that matters. That's not just for the preacher to do. That's for the Christian to do. So that the early church was known as those who were devoted to scripture. We want to be known to be devoted to scripture, to be devoted to scripture. And let me say this to each of us tonight. This is so important for me to say this. I feel it's heavily in my spirit. We must mature to a place, must mature to a, a place and a walk in our faith with the Lord that we're able to have ears that are attentive to, and quickly turned off to teaching that is either aligned with God's word or not aligned with God's word, right? We got to discontinue this practice of, of texting and sharing snippets of sermons because you felt like it was a, he, this person said something good. Saying something good, I mean, that you actually said something biblical. Help me, Holy Spirit, tonight. I'm going to get in trouble tonight, but I'm ready for it. Saying something good is when you said something biblical. 
right? We got to be careful. I grew up in church where the preacher would bark the pulpit and proclaim the word of God and the word of God did the work. The word of God touched the lives. The word of God changed the lives. The word of God saved, right? Now we got preachers doing all kinds of antics in the pulpit, right? Getting their hair cut in the pulpit and, and, and walking across the pews. And I saw a clip the other day, a preacher this past Easter service had this whole rendering where the men was carrying him, put him actually in a actual casket, was be symbolic of Jesus in the, in, 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 in the tomb, right? It's all this stuff. Right. If you preach the text properly, the text will give you the visual understanding. I don't have to get myself into a casket, put my life on the line and try to make a point. But when I make it about me, I do these type of things. Do these type of things, right? There are men and women of God in your local cities that are putting in the work in their study, stand before God's people to rightly divide the word of truth. And we, we give them no ear because we've gotten so caught up on tele tele television evangelists, right? And what they're saying. And most of the stuff don't even make sense at all. We'll be more faithful to somebody we see on TV whom we have no connection with than a local setting. And we have to understand the early church was devoted to scripture. Number two, the early church was devoted to fellowship. Again, Acts chapter two, verse 42. It says, um, and, and to fellowship. So all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship brothers and sisters hear me loud and clear if you are a believer of jesus christ if you profess to be a believer of jesus christ it ought not be a tedious task for you to be found in fellowship with other believers of jesus christ right it should not be a burden for you to have love for your brothers and sisters in the lord it should not be a burden for you for you to have love for your brothers and sisters in the lord are you hearing me? Are you hearing me tonight? We, 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 we must be careful in this regard because what's happened is, is that we find every reason, right, not to be in fellowship, right? The Bible says forsake not the fellowshipping of the saints, right? We ought to be known for being in fellowship. We ought to be known. If we say that we are children of God, that means that we're part of the same family. If we're part of the same family, then therefore we ought to be, um, happy to be in fellowship one with another we are kingdom citizens we are sons of god that word sons is not is not gender specific for males only we are sons of god right we are children of god we are kingdom citizen kingdom representatives and therefore we ought to be known for being devoted to fellowship right um as a believer uh, it is um discouraging when you overhear believers at war with other believers, it ought not be so. The Bible declares in Psalm 133, verse number one, Psalm 133, verse number one, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. Hear me now in unity, right? So the early church was devoted to fellowship. Number three, I'm just recapping that we covered so far. The third thing is they were devoted to breaking bread. The Bible says, it again, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they were devoted to breaking bread. They were devoted to breaking bread. Are we devoted to breaking bread? The Bible says here, the sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper. So it wasn't just the Lord's Supper. It was including the Lord's Supper. That means that they were devoted to the Holy Communion, but also to actually having meals together, right? Actually spending time together, right? There's something... When Jesus is preeminent, when Jesus is preeminent, when Jesus is priority number one in the church, right, then those of us who have professed that he is preeminent in our lives, we ought be able to come together and break bread together, but also with the Holy Communion. And listen now, Jesus gave the, the example how the communion ought to be done. But in the book of 1 Corinthians speaks to how you do communion, right? You got to examine yourself, right? You, if, you, if you have ought with your brother, go reconcile those matters, right? You should not be coming to the communion table knowing that you have matters unresolved with your brothers and sisters, right? So they, they were devoted to scripture. Help us tonight, Lord. Devoted to fellowship. Devoted to breaking bread. Number four, they're devoted to prayer, Right? Let me ask a question tonight just for you to hear me because you can't respond in the virtual space to, to a point where I can hear you, but I want to say it. 
Um, is, has the church walked away from prayer? He says here, and to prayer. Again, Acts 2.42, and to prayer. Has the church walked away from prayer? Have we become so accustomed and, and so um, routine in our gatherings that we don't believe in prayer no more? And I'm not talking about just somebody getting up there just saying a few words, calling it prayer. I'm talking about actually believing in the power of prayer, in the power of prayer. When I was under Pastor Walker, he would say, much prayer, much power. Little prayer, little power. No prayer, no power. Right? We can say these things because we actually believe that. Jesus says in the book of Matthew, chapter number five, dealing with the model prayer, he says, when you pray, not if you pray, but when you pray, shut the go in your closet and shut the door. There's an expectation that the believer has a prayer life. And let me go a little bit further than this. A little further than this. This is important to know now. Important to know. If the believer, I'm sorry, that was, and that was, that should have been Matthew chapter six, not chapter five, dealing with the model prayer, chapter six. But let me say this now. If you have your own personal prayer life, and I do as well, when we all come together in one unified location, it ought not be hard for prayer to continue because we've all come in having had our own personal time with the Lord and we know how to pray. Lord, help us with leaders who don't know how to pray with people who don't know how to pray, right? Prayer is a dialogue between me and my father, right? But let me say now, it's not a monologue where you dominate the time, right? Where you just spend time, and let me, I hear you, Holy Spirit, listen to me. Begging cannot be defined as praying. It was in my spirit, I gotta say it right. Begging cannot be defined as praying. You could be begging to my, I'm praying to the Lord. No, 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 no. Does your prayers align with his word? First John 5, 14. Right. You hear me say it all the time. First John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have. We ask anything in his name according to his will. Very important now. According to his will, he hears us. Listen now. Listen now. Prayer is not me just throwing things at God and saying, Lord, do this. Lord, no, no, that ain't prayer. Me saying, God, you better get them. That ain't prayer. You don't use prayer as as a way of dealing with somebody. God, go deal with, no, 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 no. You don't send God like that, right? That's not how prayer is. And the problem is people have taught us through many antics in church the, um, the wrong way to pray. We go to God, Lord, I'm believing that you're going to you gonna bless me with a brand new car by Friday. That's your prayer, right? I'm going to leave God, God you're going to make me debt free. Hold on now. Why would God make you debt free, but not teach you how to be disciplined? Just stay there, right? Like you, we can't be a healthy church if you can't handle healthy teaching. There we go, right? Why would God make you debt free and you're not disciplined, right? And so many times we have watched things and heard things. When the Prayer of Jabez book came out by Bruce Wilkinson, right? Everybody was praying, Lord, enlarge my territory, increase God, increase. And then Donald Lawrence wrote the song, right? All of a sudden started singing that. So people started believing they could say these things and God was going to do it. But let me help the church tonight. Let me help the church tonight. Um, help the church tonight misquoting the scripture does not obligate God to honor it. Can I say it again? Misquoting the scripture does not obligate God to honor it. What are you saying, Pastor D? God will honor God's word, not your interpretation of God's word. I want to help you tonight. God will honor God's word, not your interpretation of God's word. And that's what we get in trouble at. We can trouble because we have misinterpreted God's word. And we want to hold God, we want to go God to our interpretation. God didn't say that. You said that. You said that. You can't find nowhere in the word of God that the Lord said that. You said that, but you want, to, you want God to say it. And because we say it so profoundly, people assume we said something powerfully. <laughs> God, I thank you tonight. I've been in prayer, y'all. You can tell. Because we said something profound. People think that we said something powerful. It means nothing. It's because you changed the way your voice rises and set does not mean, hear me tonight, does not mean you said anything that's, that's powerful. No. Reading the Bible and reciting the word of God publicly is power all by itself. Power all by itself. It's in today's, today's um, context, in today's um um, dispensation of the church. That's the word I want you to dispensation of the church. All of a sudden now, people always saying, the Lord said, the Lord said, I hear the Lord saying, I hear the Lord saying, listen to me now, we got to be careful because God
we go. There we go. There we go. We're back on. Listen, we're going to press forward, man. Um, it's, it's just technical stuff, right? Technical stuff. I, I can do it by it. We're going to press forward. The church was all in spiriting. Hopefully you all are still there. If not, I'm going to keep teaching. You'll catch up with me. Amen. Church was all in spiriting. Number six. Number six. Number one is the saying because it's so very important. Number six, church was devoted to scripture. I purposely put number six in there. It's not an error, right? It's purposely in there because I want to overly emphasize the importance of scripture, right? That's why it's in there. I want to overly emphasize that, that understand what scripture means to the church. It's so very, very important, brothers and sisters. Listen to me now. Listen to me now. Listen to me now. The scriptures of God cannot be ignored. They cannot be ignored. Do you read your Bible? Do you believe the Bible that you read? Because here's the thing. Maybe you read your Bible, but you don't believe what you read. Maybe you're reading your Bible, but you don't believe what you read. Because that's possible, right? You're reading your Bible, but you don't believe what you're reading. And, and that's a challenge, right? Because you can read a book and have no comprehension after you read what you read. But, but our desire is for you to have biblical comprehension of the text, right? So that you can rightly divide the word of truth so that you can understand what is being said. I had to grow to this place in, in my especially in my pastorate, right? What I've narrowed in really, really aggressively who I listen to, what preachers I actually listen to locally and nationally, right? There are certain preachers I'll listen to because um, I believe they handle the text properly. Uh, I believe their, their lifestyle is indicative of what they preach and what they teach and what they believe, right? But that's very, very narrow, right? I used to be one where I was like, everybody was out falling behind the latest whomever, and I was, you know, trying to be like that person. Man, if you knew me early in my ministry, forget about passion. When I first got into ministry, you knew me, I was all over the place as a minister, right? I was trying to be everybody, T.D. Jakes and Jamal Harrison Bryan and Eddie Long at one point and R.A. Vernon. I was all over the place, right? Trying to be trying to be the best black Baptist preacher I can be and you know, trying to get to the celebration to end the sermon and trying to get to doing all that type of stuff. And and um, that's a lot of, of work, especially when you haven't dealt with the text properly. And I was doing all these things and spent all this time in study and putting together um, my manuscript to go, to go preach. And when I felt like the people weren't responding accordingly, I quickly went to the who because I knew the people were going to respond to the who. And, and what ended up happening is not only was the spirit of God convicting me heavily because I wasn't saying he was telling me to say, but people who were mature in the faith, mature in the scripture, began to call me out as well. In love, of course, but they would say, Look, Brother Minister, you got to get back to the Bible. You get back to the Bible, right? Because I was doing so much to try to get the responses of the people, right? Trying to get the amens. Because in the black church, we are a call and a response, right? I say something, you say amen. I say something, you say hallelujah. And when that becomes your motivation, Right. You don't really care about good biblical teaching as long as you get the response you wanted. Then COVID happens. Right. Fast forward. COVID happens. Every preacher now is preaching basically to a screen, whether to an empty sanctuary and a screen 
in front of a computer. And so now you're not getting the loud amens and the loud hallelujahs. And those who are committed to biblical literacy, not illiteracy, people who are who are committed to preaching, thus said the Lord. And there are a lot of local preachers who are doing that, preaching, preaching God's word the right way. We then had to lean in on what we knew, which is preach the Bible. Everything else is out now, right? You 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 can't be walking all over the pews and laying all over the pulpit. And, no, you got to preach. And then what happened is the people whom you were preaching to before, they started wanting to hear the word and not everything else because there was a fear that hit our country and hit our world because nobody knew what this COVID thing was. All of a sudden now people are no longer amused by the extracurriculars in church. They wanted to hear the word. They were searching to hear the word. Yeah, you have those who were surfing from website to website, but you have others who are locked in now on hearing the word. And some of them realize I'm under a preacher who ain't said nothing in years. I, listen, thank God for a good music ministry. Thank God for, for all that type of stuff. But, but, the, but the bedrock is Jesus and his word, right? And his word, right? At the end of the day, everything ought to, everything in church, um, is 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 built up for the word of God to be proclaimed. Singing should never replace preaching. You may not want to hear, but I'm gonna tell you, right? The proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ is the priority when we come together. Thank God for everything else, but you should never. And what's happening in churches? We're raising up lazy believers, right? They'll be accurate. They'll be engaged in the praise and worship, engaged in the dance ministry engage in the in the offer for the most part and then get sleeping when the word of god comes and you know why because the enemy wants to keep you exhausted and weary and sleepy so that you can't hear the word of god the devil don't bother you when you when you up singing with the praise team he don't bother you when you up sharing on the dance ministry but you all right you get sleepy when you when the preaching come you get restless you get sleepy you get irritated you get distracted or even at home in your own personal time you're gonna read the bible tonight Open up that Bible, all of a sudden your eyes get weary. You get sleepy, right? Because the devil is trying his best to keep you from being able to hear, receive, apply, and live the word. So the church was devoted to scripture. That's that's That was number one and number six on purpose. Number seven, the church was generous. The church was generous. Look at verse number 44. Acts chapter two, verse number 44. It said, all the believers met together in one place. Look at this now. And shared everything they had. This early, this this church was this the first church was so committed to uh, being um, a Christ example amongst each other and amongst the world. And is it possible that we are trying to win the world, and we didn't win our block yet? Whew, Lord, help me tonight. You're trying to win the world. You want to have a national, international ministry. And the people in your community even know who you are. They don't know nothing about you or your church. Years ago, I was in prayer years ago, and the Spirit of the Lord asked me a very profound question. And it became the motivation for um, our ministry where we are located. The Spirit of the Lord asked me this question. If the church, if your church were to burn down today, would anyone know you ever existed? If the church burned down today, would anyone know you ever existed? And that question... Um, was profound and scary because um, I was so focused. We were so focused on doing a lot of stuff, but we weren't making impact in the area by which we were in, right? And that question became my motivation as a pastor and us as a people to make sure that we are um, preaching, teaching, living, and loving people based on Jesus Christ in the area around our church, right? No fanfare, no cameras, no, no posting on social media. It's intentionally loving God's people, right? Inside and outside the four walls, right? I'm not trying to win that the cross town, right? I'm trying to win the people around my neighbor, around our church, right? Why be in this community and not impact this community for the glory of Jesus Christ? Church was generous. And a lot of times we're trying to win the world. We hadn't won our block. Trying to win the world. We hadn't won our community. The people in the neighborhood, have no relationship, no connection, no involvement, no understanding of who you are and what you are doing, right? And understand that at Bible-based church, uh, I don't have the exact percentage, but I will say this to you. More than 50% of our members, I would even argue more than 60% of our members, maybe more than seven, I don't know. These are more than 60, don't live in the neighborhood where our church is located. We commute there for our gatherings, right? 
And I thank God for that. For the for for but, but but let me say this to you. I know that God put us on that side of town. I know that. That's been resolved. I know that to be true, that God put us on the south side of Tallahassee to make impact. Because I believe, I'm daring enough to believe, crazy enough to believe that there is good on the south side of Tallahassee. Right? And so um, did we have chances to move to the east side? Absolutely. When we're looking to, to buy buy building and land, we looked at we looked everywhere. And the Spirit of God brought me right back to where we were. Right. We saw empty buildings. We saw parcels of land. We saw things here or there. I would get phone calls. I was riding around there. I saw a church be good for you, God. I would go look at it. It would be it was amazing. The spirit of the Lord would always shut that door. I mean, right back to where we were, right back to where we were, right back to where we were. Right back to where we were. Because because the Lord said to me, I did not raise you up to leave where I raised you up to be. Hear me tonight. I did not raise you up. To raise you up, to, to let you leave from where I raised you up to be, right? It's easy to go across town, right? It's easy to go the other way, but 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 the Lord said, "No, I put you there for a reason. Put you there for a reason." And then God began to deal with our ministry about what we're supposed to be doing, and others as well in the, in, are doing things. It's not just our church doing it, but this is our church Bible study. I'm just thinking about what we do, right? But the church was generous. It says right here, all the believers, verse 44, met together in one place and shared everything they had. What would it look like for today's local church to actually be a church that's known for being generous? Where, where it's not, a, you don't have to get to the pulpit and beg the people, right? Now, I get it. I get it. We, 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 we all may know of some examples where the church misappropriated and mishandled money. I get it. I get it. But, but let me say this to you. It's unfair and it's immature of you to indict every Christian church off of the misbehavior of one or two Christian churches. And yet we do it, right? It's, it's like, it's not fair for, for you to um, um, define all preachers off that one preacher's mishap. And yet we do it, right? And yet we do it, right? We, we're supposed to be generous, right? The Bible says the Lord loves a, what, a cheerful giver, right? Uh, we, we ought not be stingy in our giving. We ought to be we ought to be be very right. Like I'm a believer, as you all know, of financial integrity and good financial stewardship. Right. I'm a, I'm a believer of that. Right. I speak openly about how our church, those who are members of the church, how we handle finances, how things are done. My interaction with the church finances, what I do and I don't do where I'm at, where I'm where I'm not at. I don't, I'm not in a finance room helping them count money. Right. When that door locks and in their account, we have a team that does that. Right. I don't go in there. Right. There's a camera that's in that room pointing in their room, watching them do that. So we have accountability that takes place. Right. We have bank accounts that, that show that monies are being deposited and then being used properly. Right. Um, we've never had an indictment made against our church for financial impropriety. Right. Our bills get paid. Right. Payroll is made on a regular basis. Even during COVID, my desire was everybody who gets paid at the church kept getting paid at the church. No one went without payment during COVID. Thanks be unto God for his provision and for the vision God gave. We run the church off the Joseph principle. We have stored up in the years of surplus compared to the years of famine. When COVID came, COVID was a, was a year it was famine. Right. Because some churches had to shut their door because they, they were not able to financially maintain. That wasn't our story. That wasn't our story. And not because Pastor D is such a great businessman. Thank God that I have some business acumen, but because we we heed the voice of God, because number four is we're devoted to prayer. So when we devoted to prayer, when we heard God speak, we responded accordingly. Find accordingly. I'm not the pastor who has a church, church um, credit card in my pocket. And I'm going out there and mishandling money. We don't do that. If we say we we gonna we gonna we gonna use this money to put a, a new doorknob on the door, when you come next Sunday, you gonna see a new doorknob on the door, right? I've been in church my entire life. I've been a part of many building funds, right? And some of you can laugh and say, and we get to see a building get erected, right? It's funny, but it ain't funny, because what happens is people start asking questions: Where the money going? And so all of a sudden now you up there begging the people every Sunday, begging the people every Sunday, and the people stop giving because they don't see no accountability. Right. Um, Scott Beagle. Scott Beagle is is the founder of Faith Radio. Right. Heaven. Um, um, 1450 AM. Right. And I think the thing is AM FM station as well. But Scott Beagle is the founder of Faith Radio here in Tallahassee and the surrounding area. And Scott Beagle is known for giving this quote. He said people 
don't give to maintenance, they give to ministry. People don't give to maintenance, they give to ministry, right? When people give to ministry, they entrust you to maintain how things are supposed to be done, right? And so when people give to the ministry, they're trusting us to do right by the money that's been raised. Absolutely. Absolutely, right? The Lord is a cheerful giver. We ought not give grudgingly. We ought not give with attitude, right? We ought not be mad about giving. Those monies are necessary, right? There's two parts of the church, the local church. There's the spiritual and there's the administrative, right? The spiritual, the administrative. The spiritual is you come in on Sunday morning for good good church service, a Sunday school and, 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 and worship service, for Bible study, right, for our small groups, for our rehearsal. That's all the spiritual. The administrative stuff you don't think about, right? Somebody got to pay the bills, right? Payroll got to be met. We got to pay utility bills, right? We got to make sure that we keep the, the grounds um, maintained, right? We want to make sure that we have money in the money market account. We want to make sure that, that when we do renovations, that we have the money to be able to cover those type of things, right? We want to make sure that that if, that we, we can say that we're debt-free and be honest about those type of things, right? That's administrative, right? When we have when we have police officers coming for our New Year's Eve service to canvas our parking lot and our land, they got to be paid. When we're doing these community events and we bring in um, police officers to help us block, block off street, they have to be paid. That's administrative, right? You don't have to worry about that. That gets done. That's the part of the church nobody talks about, right? Those things are going to be good. When you come in there, hit that light, switch, them lights come on, somebody had to pay those bills. That's administrative. That's administrative, right? When you go to the bathroom and you look for some toilet paper and it's there, look for some soap and it's there, somebody had to buy that stuff. That's administrative. Right. That comes from being cheerful giver, tithe paying, seed sowing, offering giving. Right. Um, um, th those things are important. The church was generous. It says right here, they got together in one place and shared everything they had. Those who had a lot brought it in and those who had nothing were able to benefit off of that. So a little bit further. Number eight, the church was evangelistic. Help me tonight, Holy Spirit. Church was evangelistic. Church was evangelistic. Um, we come in to be fed the word of God and we go out to work that word. We come in for fellowship and to be fed, we go out to work. When you come back, the next time you come back in there, right? Let's say you come on Sundays and you leave, come back next Sunday. You ought to come back the next Sunday um, close to being on empty because you've been out there working off that word you received. You're out there working in the vineyard. You're out there being a laborer, right? You're out there being used of the Lord to do great and mighty things, right? The problem is we're raising up spiritually obese believers. We're raising up spiritually obese believers. What does that mean, Pastor D? People who just come and just eat the word, 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 but they ain't putting no work in. They ain't doing nothing. They ain't doing They just eating, just eating, just eating, just eating, just eating. And they ain't doing nothing with the word they're eating. They're not sharing it with nobody. They're not applying that word to their lives. They're not reading their Bible. They ain't doing nothing with it at all. You talk to nobody about Jesus at all. You, not even people in your household has ever heard you talk about Jesus Christ. None of it's happening. None of it's happening. None of it's happening at all. At all. Pastor say, I give you a time. I want everyone y'all to invite me to one person in the church. You get real nervous. Real nervous, right? You get up on Sunday morning, right? You leave your house to come to church and the rest of your household is still at home. Still at home. I grew up under under a, a grandmother and a mama, right? Where you go, you come to church on Sunday morning. You know how they, they tell you, I don't care what you did on Saturday night. You're going to be in church on Sunday morning and you better be woke when you come in here. The church was evangelistic. The Bible says he that when his souls is wise. Right. Jesus sent them out two by two to go out there two by two. At one point, he, in, he inquired of his disciples and say, um, what are they saying about me out there? Some say you are John the Baptist. Some say you the other prophet. Some say you are Elijah. Then he asked him, who do you say that I am? This is in the gospel according to Matthew. Um, Peter said, you are the Christ, son of the living God. You have spoken well, Peter. Um, Spirit, I get it to you, and upon this rock, I'll build my church, so on and so forth, right? But he asked him, what are they saying out there about me? Well, you don't know what they're saying if you ain't going out there. You're going out there. Um, the Bible says in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, go ye therefore. Go. That's a verb. That's an action. That's a requirement. Go. 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 Not sit. Go. Not sit. Go. We're not saved to sit. We're saved to serve. You ought to be going. We put all that onus on the preacher. 
Pastor, you know, my family member needs you to come to the hospital. I don't mind going to the hospital at all, but you ought to be going as well. Somebody asked me years ago, Pastor, can you come and bless my house? And I don't mind blessing houses, right? If, if, if we can make it work it out, happy to come. But you know what's better than me coming to bless your house? Me teach you how to bless your own house. Because you got to live there. I don't. I can come and pray over your brand new house and plead the blood of Jesus. Right. But if, but if, but if the homeowner, hear me, Holy Ghost, if the homeowner is the one bringing in the demons, what is my prayer going to do if you don't want, if you're the carrier of the demons in your own dwelling? If you are engaging in ungodly activity in your dwelling that you know is counter to God's word, me praying over your house means nothing if you keep engaging in, in demonic activity. I know y'all get mad, but sit there. We can't be a healthy church if you can't handle healthy teaching. Right? We got to be evangelistic. We have to have a burden for souls, a burden for evangelizing, right? A burden for this. Right. Well, where where we are walking, talking testimonies, right? Walking, talking witnesses. The way you live is a witness. How you treat people is a witness. You hear me? The way you live is a witness. How you treat people is a witness. How you speak is a witness. Right. How you interact is a witness. It's not just what you do on Sunday mornings. How are you at work? If I came to your job. And I inquired of your colleagues and your coworkers about you. What would they say about you? Would they say, I ain't know she was saved. I ain't know he was saved. That's an indictment to your Christian world. That means that you're not living an example for them. We are representatives of Christ in the earth. We have to be mindful of how we live. We are witnesses for the Lord. We are witness. People are watching us. Hear me now. Hear me. Is it possible that, that because of how you live, your kids don't want to get saved? Is it possible that the way you treat people, the way your loved ones won't get saved? Because they're looking at you saying, if that's Christianity, I don't want that. Is it possible? I'm just asking. Is it possible? I'm, I'm just asking, right? I'm just asking you. Um, let's go a little bit further, right? Let's go a little bit further. Number nine, I'm, I'm, I'm taking this to the end. I'm, 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 I'm committed. I'm, I'm committed. Rock with me, right? Number nine, the church was joyous. Whew. Look at this now. Look at verse number 46. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met at home for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. There was The church was joyous. Who wants to come to a dead church? Who wants to come to um, a fear-based church? Um, angry people, church. No, we, joy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy, right? Not, not, joy. I mean, no, no matter what's going on in my life, I'm excited about being in fellowship. I believe that something's going to happen in our gathering. The, the church was joyous. The church was joyous. I mean, every song they sang, they sang it loud in both churches. When I was in Uganda back in 2017, um, I shared this before that these people, the people in Uganda, such a wonderful people. God, please, God bless them even now. I think about them. Wonderful people. Um, very aware of their of their poverty. But on Sunday morning, I had a chance to preach on Sunday morning. On Sunday morning, to watch these African brothers and sisters who don't have what we have. They struggle just to make it through each day. But on Sunday mornings, they put on their Sunday bed. They put on their African regalia. They walk miles to come to church. We were in church for five hours, not an exaggeration. Three hours of praise and worship music. This is not an exaggeration. This is an awesome church, right? But they believe in the Bible. They believe in the Jesus of the Bible. They came and gave, they, they wanted to be in their best. And I'm talking about, they singing the songs of Zion loud and boisterous, right? Loud and boisterous. They ain't looking around, see who's watching them. They giving it unto God. But over here in the West, here in the States, Right. We, we look around, see you watching, you know, I don't praise like that. And, and I, I, I'm, you know, I, I, I pray, I, I pray from within. Come on, man. Like, like a, a, a people, I had a chance years ago, me and Sharita uh, in the, in the tabernacle, Mission Baptist Church choir had a chance. We was at tabernacle to go to FCI, our federal prison here and minister there. I had a chance to preach there, the choir sang. And man, when we were walking, we came through security they're walking us down the main pathway in the quad area to go to the, in the very in the very back of the quad area is 
um, basically their their community center or where they have church at. And we're walking down this big old quad area to get there. As we get closer, you can hear music. You can hear singing. They're, they're having good church in there. And when you walk in, if you don't know where you are, you walk in, you're in there with, with nothing but prisoners. FEI is a women's prison for the most part, right? Walking into prison to women. And I'm talking about loud music playing. They singing and praising and crying. And, and we walk in and we come in there to have church with them to preach and to sing them and encourage their heart. We walked in. They didn't wait on us. We walked in and joined, but they had already begun. They were, the church was joyous. It's now they're incarcerated. When we leave here tonight, they're going back to their cells. But in that, but in during that time, those people were free in their worship. How is it that a people who are incarcerated based on crimes they committed can praise God so freely? And those of us who live free every day don't live free every day. I just want to ask that question. I just want to ask that question. They, they, they were, the choices, they were, the Bible says with great joy and generosity, right? I, I, one of my favorite things to see on Sundays, man, God knows it is, is to see when our church, before we start, right, the Sunday school ends, between Sunday school and, and the morning service starting, and after we finished um, church service and the benediction, to see the saints of God in fellowship with each other. Church is over. It's been over for a while. People are still hanging around, talking and laughing and having a good old time. Man, I love seeing that level of fellowship and joy, right? Where church is over, it's been over, and people are still hanging around, laughing and joking and conversing, and, and the kids are playing around. I love seeing that. I love seeing that. To me, that is indicative of a healthy church. Yeah, we have our issues with a healthy church because people just love being around each other. Number 10, I'm getting to number 12 tonight. Number 10 is church was a church was worshipful. All right. Church was worshipful. The Bible says, I mean, general, I think number seven, verse number um, 47, all the while praising God. Look at that. They were, they were with meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God. The church was, was worshipful. When we come together, shouldn't we be worshiping the Lord? But I want to I want to indict the local church tonight, if I can. Um, we ought to worship the Lord with songs that worship the Lord. Um, every gospel artist should not be played in church. Every gospel song should not be played in church. I'm going to hit you with something now because every gospel song ain't gospel centered. Even the gospel industry has become commercialized. You may not want to hear, but I'm going to tell you, right? Every song you hear on gospel radio should not be sang in God's church. You may not want to hear, but I'm going to say it to you anyway. We got to be mindful, right? Right. That we got to be mindful how we do things. The church ought to look different than the world. Than the world, right? You won't come to church to go to no concert. This is the name of the church is. It's the church of the living God, right? People don't come in here to be, you should not come to church to entertain people. That, that's not the mindset of the church. I mean, I'm going through too much to come in here and watch y'all perform. No, nah, man. When, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I or the preacher of the Bible-based church barked that pulpit, in my spirit, I hear the people of God asking me a question. Pastor D, is there a word from the Lord? In my spirit, I hear that. Right. So throughout my week, when I'm studying and preparing and writing my manuscript and praying and studying and preparing and writing and praying. That question rings in my ear. So when I bark the pulpit on Sunday mornings or I'm out doing itinerant preaching assignments, I'm not I'm not preaching somebody downloaded sermon. I've been in God's face. I heard God speak the word of God. This is me now. The word of God never gets stale. This is the bread of heaven. It don't get stale. It don't get stale. Even if you don't read the word of God, the word of God never gets stale. Never gets stale. The, are the, do the songs that we sing in church actually get a heavenly response? Or are we just singing because it's the popular songs out there, so we're going to bring it to church? No, 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 no. Do these songs actually move heaven? Does the Lord know that these songs we sing in actually are about him? Because now songs, songs are no longer now saying anything about Jesus in the songs anymore. They're not even scripturally based anymore, right? It's just a good beat, right? But 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 are we actually saying anything? That the, the, the church was worshipful. 
The Bible says, all while praising God. While praising God. If I sit through one church service, whether at Bible based church or anywhere else, I would hope that I hear the name of Jesus mentioned. I would hope that I hear the word of God proclaimed where I can actually follow along with the preacher. Let me go a little bit further. I know when I preach, I, I, I like to, I'm narrative at times, or I'll give a story, right, to make make the text proper. Because I'm a believer, take the saints to Jerusalem, and then bring Jerusalem to the saints. Like, how, do, how does, like, make them understand what the Bible is saying, then help them comprehend how does this apply to my life? Like, you got, you got to know how to do that as a preacher, right? The Holy Spirit helps you in that regard. But nobody comes and sits under a 30 to 40 minute sermon by Pastor D or the ministerial staff to hear us give our opinions about stuff. I didn't come for you to preach for 30 minutes about politics, right? I didn't come for you to give me your opinion on, on what's going on in sports. You may use it as an example, but I don't want to hear about that. I want to hear, thus saith the Lord. What is God saying? And sometimes what happens is because, because preachers are ill-prepared, they're, they're just shooting from the hip saying stuff. Let me finish 11 and 12. I'm almost at that time, right? Number 11, the church was reputable. Whew. What does that mean? What does reputable mean? It means they had a good reputation. The church had a good reputation. When your local church name is uttered, what are folks saying about that church? All right? All right? I always laugh when I'm around preachers who speak ill of other churches. I, I'm quick to catch you on that. Hold on, man. We don't do that. I don't, don't even be around me with that type of stuff. And usually what happens is jealousy has sunk into that preacher. All of a sudden, now you're speaking ill of that church because you're jealous. Mm-mm. 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 What's the reputation of that church? What is that church known for? Because guess what, brothers and sisters? Um, that church is known for something. It's known for something. Th this church here had a good reputation. Good reputation. Let me go a little bit further. The reputation was not based on Peter. It was based on the people of God doing the work, doing what God required of them. A lot of times we put all the pressure on the pulpit. But what about the pews? What about the parking lot? What about the pavement? Right? What, what are we doing as a people? As a people. Shame on us for being children of God and come to church. And sit still on God when God been good all week long. Shame on us. Shame on us. And shame on us in the pulpit, in the choir, and in the praise team for coming in with the motivation trying to move the people. The audience is vertical. If the vertical is pleased, the horizontal can sit still all they want. But what's happening is we're trying to move the horizontal. We've ignored the vertical. Help me tonight, Holy Spirit. Hurts had a good, had a good reputation, man. They was known for something. Lord, help us tonight. They name, that name meant something. That church over there, man, they preached the word of God over there. That church over there, man, they, they, they're, they're blessing the community for the name of Jesus Christ. That church over there, right, they're, they're, they're doing some amazing things. That pastor, no, nah, man, he ain't known for that type of lifestyle, right? No, she ain't known for that. That, that pastor, that, that, over there, no, nah, man, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. They do right with, with the money. Over there, Jesus is preeminent over there. Over there at that church, right? Right? When you're doing what thus said the Lord, you got to travel the community trying to convince people of what your church is all about. It's there. Here's why. Here's why I can say that to you. Because number 12, the 12 characteristics, 12, the 12 characteristics of the early church in Acts 2 is number 12. Ready for it? I'm going to give it to you. Ready for it? Number 12 is this. Church was growing. Church was growing. Look at the end of verse of, of, of chapter two. It said, and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Each day. Church was growing. Church was growing. The growth is number 12 because the growth comes after everything else is done right. And maybe our problem is we're trying to grow the church, but we haven't established the foundation of the church. Right? We're more worried about packing out seats we ain't got no scriptural foundation. We, we're not firm in the things of God. We're trying to pack out the church, though, right? right we want to be known. How you got over, I mean, you got over there, Doc? What you got over there going on, Doc? 
We preach through every Sunday, Doc. As we worried about that type of conversation. We're trying to grow the church our way. Our way. Let me be honest with y'all. I got to close this way now. Um, I went through this season, especially during COVID, where I was really frustrated with, with um, what I felt like a bad hand God dealt me. God, I'm, I'm trying to be a biblically sound preacher. And, you know, I found myself doing ministry comparisons. I'm transparent as they come, right? And I was getting really discouraged, man, really discouraged about things. And the first thing the Holy Spirit told me is stop. Stop what, God? Stop whining. Stop complaining and stop comparing. Those are the three things the Lord said to me. Stop whining, stop complaining, and stop comparing. Because all three of those things are self. They're self. You're whining because you feel like something. Complaining because you feel like something, right? You're comparing because you're trying to see something. It's all self. It nothing to do with the Lord. And whenever you compare your life to somebody else, it's self. The Lord says, stop. Stop. As the Holy Spirit told me. Be found faithfully preaching and teaching my word. I'll do everything else. Don't let nobody bark the pulpit of Bible-based church who not going to commit themselves to preaching and teaching. That means the ministerial staff or any guest preachers. I don't care who the latest is. Don't bring them in this, don't bring them into this building if they ain't committed to preaching and teaching the word of God. That was what the Lord told me. He said, be found doing, I'll do everything else. So when the Lord has been, God is growing us tremendously, right? That's the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. That's the Lord's doing. That's on the Lord. He's doing that. We're being found faithfully preaching and teaching the word of God. That's why you've seen me in the last couple of few years like saying no to things, right? If what we're trying to do is not biblically sound, the answer is no, out the gate. I don't care how good of an idea it is. Pastor, can we do this? What does the Bible say? Let's read the word of God. What is the word of God saying? If we can't find it in the word of God, we ain't doing it at our church. We're not doing it. Because ultimately, I'm responsible as God's under shepherd at the, at the place for allowing things to happen in church. If I know we shouldn't be doing it, why am I letting it be done? I, I, listen, I love my youth. I love my youth. Having said that, no is still the answer. And when the Lord finds us to be faithful to trying to do the local, do church the way he's assigned it to be, church, the church grows. But let me, let me hit you with this now. Um, here is talking about growing numerically. And while that's a blessing, I want us to grow spiritually. I want us to grow from membership to discipleship, right? Members come to church. Disciples serve the church. Members come to church. Disciples serve the church. I want us to grow in that regard. And, and you can't grow God's people if you ain't teaching people God's word. Thank you for allowing me to go beyond the time I normally go. But I was committed to getting us through this tonight. Right? Because I want to I want to shift us to dealing with um, the spiritual gifts. Because now that we've talked about these characteristics and i'm going to talk to you about the gift that god has you right because the church everything we need for our church is in the church god has gifted all of us with at least one gift what are we doing with those gifts god gave us what are we doing with it what are we doing with it what are we doing with it other than sitting there what are we doing with it because it's easy to sit in your seat and judge people who's serving but once you get up and serve as well get up and serve as well Right. We need greeters. We need parking lot attendees. We need ushers. Right. We, we need these things. It may not be the glorious ministry, but there's a need there. You have a beautiful smile. You have a wonderful personality. You love people. Why are you not a greeter? Why you don't want to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord? Right. Everybody can't be out front. Somebody got to be willing to, to, to help in the parking lot. Somebody got to be helped be a part of the security team. Right. Somebody got to be helped be, be agreed to. Do, do other things and then do with you being in front of a microphone. Since when are those ministries not important? Since when? It's not important because we make it seem like it's not important. But everything matters. Before I come out of my office to preach on Sunday morning, you've had many encounters. From the time you got out your car with that parking lot team, time you, you came you came in and you met the, the our, our greeting team, to time you hit, hit the ushers, the time you got to your seat and all of a sudden the ministry opened up the service, to the music ministry, the rest of my come out, you've had so many encounters. And if those are, if those encounters are negative and demonic, my preaching becomes that much more challenging. Why? Because you've had so many encounters and now you're frustrated when I come out. If 
Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this teaching assignment. Thank you for trusting me as um, a herald of your message. Father, I pray tonight in the name of Jesus that we as a people of God would be challenged. Um, our assignment this year is a year of a healthy church. And I do pray, oh God, that we could be that church. But we can't be healthy church if we can't handle healthy teaching. And that means that the teaching has to challenge us and convict us and stretch us. Holy Spirit, have your way. Bless your people tonight in the wonderful master's name of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. I love you all. And thank God for each and every one of you. It is really, I mean, that with all sincerity. Thank God for all of you. Thank you for being um, willing to stay engaged tonight. We had an earlier difficulty with our technology. We pressed through that. We went past the normal time. I like to, I like to end at a certain time. We went past that. Thank you all for, for staying in, right? This, this is the assignment of the church. And let me, let me just try to encourage, if there happens to be any preachers on tonight, let me try to encourage them tonight as I'm being encouraged. Remain faithful to the teaching. Remain faithful to the study. Remain faithful to the preaching. God never called you to grow a church. That's God's doing. That's God's doing. That's, that's God's doing. As, as a person who struggled with this for a while in my pastorate, let me help you tonight. God never calls you to grow the church. That's God's doing. Free yourself from that burden. That's not your responsibility. That's on God. God may leave your church at 25, 30, or 40, or 50 people. Be grateful. E. Dewey Smith says it this way. When I ask me, how many people you got over there you preaching to? No, he tell them, more than I deserve. If you got one member, that's more than you deserve to have. If you got if you got one member, that's more than you deserve to have. Be faithfully found studying and preparing to preach to that one. And if God grow you to two, thank God for that. But don't be caught up trying to be that you ignore what you're supposed to be doing. Blessings be upon all you tonight and our comings and in our goings. I thank the Lord for you. Now I want to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we may ask or think because of the power that worketh in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. May the Lord bless you is my earnest prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, don't just be blessed, live blessed. God bless you all. Have a great evening.